Magic.me is the world's greatest school for magic, meditation, and mysticism. You can learn everything there from chaos magic to hermeticism to meditation to how to supercharge your finances and take absolute control of your destiny. In short, you get all of the tools you need to turn chaos into beautiful, scintillating order and master your life. It's incredible. You've probably heard me talk about it on the show quite a lot, but check it out. It's growing fast. And I just want to say, if you're confused about where to start, because I have so many courses there, the Adept Initiative is the place to go. The Adept Initiative is the flagship course on magic.me, and it contains everything you need to know to master the most profound ancient techniques of changing your consciousness and the most modern and cutting edge tools and systems for absolutely turning your life into a masterpiece. You are really going to dig it. Go check it out, and I will see you in class. It's magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. Yes, hello. It's Jason Lube. Welcome back to the Ultra Culture podcast. My guest today is the Scottish writer David Keenan, a literary and musical polymath known for his innovative contributions to the English cultural scene. Born in April 1971, Keenan has worn many hats from running Glasgow's iconic record shop Volcanic Tongue to shaping the dialogue around experimental music genres in The Wire magazine. As an author, he has written four critically acclaimed novels with his debut, this is Memorial Device, bagging the Collier Bristow Award for debut fiction. But today, we will be delving into Keenan's seminal work, England's Hidden Reverse, an in-depth exploration of the English esoteric musical underground, featuring exclusive biographies of genre-defying bands, Coil, Current 93, and Nurse with Wound, Based on exclusive interviews and privileged access to the band's personal archives, England's Hidden Reverse unveils the unique cultural, artistic, and sexual milieu of the English underground. A new expanded edition of the book is going to be released next month from Strange Attractor Press in the UK, and will be further enriched by nearly 100 additional pages from Furfur, a compilation of interviews with musicians and artists whose careers intersected with these iconic bands. The bands we're talking about in this podcast will hopefully need no introduction to the listeners of this podcast, but suffice to say, if you don't know them, they were the most influential uh, cultural movers in getting magic out to the world in the, the late 1970s and 1980s, starting with Throbbing Gristle and Psychic TV on into Coil, Current 93, Nurse with Wound, and others, the industrial underground of that time that Keenan has named England's Hidden Reverse, was nothing short of monumental for basically creating global a culture. Uh, this podcast would not exist uh, uh, without, without those bands, uh, nor would uh, magic as I teach it at magic.me, or as you likely know it, particularly if you've been exposed to chaos magic in any of its forms. This is, I think, one of my favorite episodes that I've done so far on the podcast, and it definitely bears repeat listening. Um, we spend most of the show talking about magic, actually, and we go deep. It's, this, is a, this was an amazing show. So without any further ado, please welcome David Keenan. Lovely to meet you. Yeah, lovely to meet you, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, when I talked to Mark Pilkington, he said you were I had re, had reinvented yourself as a fiction writer, and we're not so much interested in talking about this. But uh, hopefully, you're up for it for the revised edition. Oh yeah, totally. Okay, great, wonderful. This is a huge topic. I have the book in front of me, the original one, which I love, mm -hmm. and it's the the Bible of of this scene. Where do we even begin with this topic? I think that you you gave a great name to it, England's Hit in Reverse, but we're kind of talking about industrial, post-industrial, but particularly the culture scene around 
Throbbing Gristle, Coil, Psychic TV, Current 93, uh, and many, many other people. Yep. Where do we even start with this? England in the 70s, you know, Throbbing Gristle? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I mean, my my own discovery of it was probably was probably through Nurse with Wound, was probably the first group I heard out of that whole circle. And I maybe came to that because um through I was hanging out with a lot of record collectors and the first Nurse with Wound album, Chance Meeting on a Dissecting Table, was this legendarily rare private press weirdo experimental record. And so I sort of checked that out. And I think maybe it was once I began discovering current 93 and uh, Throbbing Gristle, I began joining the dots and realised there was this whole parallel self-supporting kind of DIY experimental scene that was somehow factoring in all these very interesting, uncovered or underground aspects of Englishness and English identity, and we're uncovering a whole culture, a whole historical milieu that th th these bands were the sort of latest manifestation of, and I always love art and music that, that turns you on the other stuff, that opens up other worlds to you. And they turned me on to so many writers, so much artists, that I began just joining the dots and thinking, hey, there's a whole there's a whole culture, a whole world in here, and certainly a book to be written about it, you know? Right. I, I take it that you're Scottish, I'm guessing. Yeah, <laughs> Glasgow. Uh, excellent, yeah. <laughs> um, so you were, you were observing this from up north then? Yeah, it's weird. I mean, and it was for me, it's, it's a particularly uh, English thing, an English manifestation. And the, the, a lot of the music had a connection to me with the uh, folk music, you know, English folk music. It felt to me almost like current 93, perhaps most explicitly, but it felt to me that these bands were part of that, of a kind of of a continuum that was specifically English. Also, the idea of the English eccentric, there's always been a sort of. Um, um, an English culture, sort of, a sort of sometimes weary, but certainly a, a reverence of the eccentric or a putting up with eccentricity. And this seemed another manifestation of that as well. Definitely. So I, I have a, for me, this is the most fascinating, authentic, interesting musical and, and otherwise subculture of the late 20th century. And, and it's one that I was, you know, tangentially part of. I mean, I, I, uh, I lived, worked, and lived and worked with Genesis for seven years in New York, and did the Psychic Bible, and was around all of that, and was around um, Topi and, and and all of that. But this was in New York in the two thousand, so it was kind of a bit a bit later on. Um, and obviously, the scene is a whole lot bigger than Throbbing Gristle and Psychic TV. But in looking at this, maybe there's three ways to. I, in kind of organizing my notes for this interview, I'm looking at this and thinking there's maybe three things to talk about here. We can talk about it as a, mus a pure musical phenomenon. We can talk about it as a cultural phenomenon and the impact that it had on culture. And then we can talk about it as, I think, a clearinghouse of ideologies. It just seems like everyone involved in this scene was involved in some type of a cult or magical or countercultural pursuit, and they were all kind of mashing them together and seeing what came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that last one is one that particularly, um, particularly interests me. It's a lot of the practice of a lot of all of the, the it, what they have in common, perhaps, is a sort of belief in the ability of art to be transformative. To be utterly transformative, you know, and whether these practices spill over and actually occult practices or not, I think it's a belief that you can do something, you can make some act, you can enact some kind of ritual that will literally transform reality. And for me, that's what their music and that's what book, the books they turned me on to did for me. You know, they had a basic faith and this sort of transform of a power of art, which to me is magic. I mean, when people say to me, well, you know, I, 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 I don't believe in magic, I kind of want to say to them, well, do you believe in art? Do you believe <laughs> in this thing that has no objective existence that you can't really point to anywhere, but which, if you believe in it, transforms your reality? Well, most people will say they do. So I say, well, you believe in magic because art is magic. Beautiful. So let's focus on that because I think that's obviously uh, I, I teach magic for a living, and and I, I think it's uh, what most people are interested in, in in this podcast. But maybe we should back up first, and then let's delve straight into that. Um, for people who are not familiar with this scene, maybe can you give a broad overview of the the personalities involved and the time period we're talking about and why it's important? 
we're talking, it's kind of post-punk, although Throb and Gristle were really sort of uh, uh, working parallel to punk. And Throb and Gristle were so far ahead that it's it's almost unbelievable to think they were they were actually happening at the same time with punk because they were one of the few groups that really, in a way, although they weren't punk, that truly took punk at its word. In other words, they really were musicians who couldn't play their instruments making music. And you know, the Sex Pistols, and I love the Pistols, I love UK punk, but um, the idea that if you can't play an instrument, you could play the set first Sex Pistols album is laughable. You would need to be able to play an instrument to play those songs. But Throbbing Gristle, genu- it was genuinely known musicians. So that was that was one of the really massively liberating things about them. And also, early on, they became a sort of clearing house for sort of alternative cultural information well before you had things like uh, like the internet. You'd yeah. have things like the Amok catalogue or yeah. things like that, which were massive to me when I was growing up. But industrial yeah. records that um, Genesis P. Orange and Cozy and the rest of Throbbing Gristle formed became like a sort of place that disseminated alternative information. You could write to them and you could get your hands on photocopied uh, 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 rituals by Alistair Crowley or they would turn you on to Austin Osman Spear. They would point to these other books. So it became so much more than just a band. This culture sort of came out of it. And out of this incredible moment in culture came all these other bands. So they came Psychic TV, which was the post Robin Gristle one, which is Peter Christofferson and Genesis Peorage from the original group, Wayne Want to Form. Amazing group. But, um, first through a pop take on what Robin Gristle were doing, became increasingly involved in Ritual and Acid House. From that was Birth Coil, which is Peter Christofferson again, but this time with John Balance, who had previously been a group called Zoskia. And again, they were very, very ritual based, very, very much into applying the ideas of Crowley and Austin Osman Spear to music and experimenting with that. And parallel to this, you've got Current 93, another group that really came out of Psychic TV again, who were more folk influenced. And then the final group I talk about is Nurse with Wound, who are a slightly odd fit in a way because. You know, you know, Stephen isn't a sort of occultist in that kind of way, and he isn't perhaps as interested in that culture. He really just sees himself as a sort of sonic artist. But he's worked with so many of those people, and he came out of that sort of same scene that they're all kind of associated together. Yeah, some of the tangential characters are super interesting for me as well, like Freya Aswin and Hilmar and um, and people like that, where it starts to diverge more into pure pagan or magical practice. Let's talk about the moment where this all started. I mean, it was basically Throbbing Gristle, uh, if I'm correct. And why did all, what was it about the culture in England in the late 70s that forced this to happen? Was it just the sheer personality, which was pretty formidable of the people involved in the self mythologizing and all of that? Or what, you know, what do you, in studying this so much, what was the confluence of events and, and cultural factors and, and dissatisfaction with, with, with politics maybe that produced this? Yeah, I think the late 1970s and early 80s were certainly a mag- a time of a magical revival. And although I think it, is, it can be part to sort of try and, you know, just point to like single causes. One of the things I think perhaps is the sort of sense of kind of like uh, hopelessness under Thatcher perhaps turned people more to experimenting on themselves um, more a little bit, perhaps looking inward, there was a lot more sort of increased drug use and a sort of sense of permission. Balance always talked about it as a sort of sense of permission. So get under the bonnet and sort of, sort of rewire yourself a little bit. And also, I think one of the things that also helped it survive was was dole culture in the UK mm. because you could actually afford to be unemployed and actually do some stuff there. And so, so many bands and so much art was kind of taking place under, you know, in the underground. It was kind of like funded by dole culture a little bit. But sometimes I just think that the magic comes back. It has these cycles, these circles. It never dies and it always always kind of returns in, in, in new ways. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's interesting to to look at this scene I mean, Jen used to say, he used to call things like this hot spots where there's certain confluences of, of magical thinkers all come together. And, you know, earlier examples would be, you know, Burroughs, Bur- excuse me, Burroughs and Geisen at the Bardo Hotel or even Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard in, in LA in the 50s uh, or, you know, Crowley and Spare and some of the things more closer to the, t- to the turn of the century, the Golden Dawn, things like that. Um, so, but you think it, you think there's like kind of like, regular cycles with this or it just seems to happen when it needs to 
I think I can. I wouldn't say it was regular cycles, but sort of magic kind of seems to appear when it's kind of needed in a way. Um, and I mean, you know, one of the interesting things that I discovered about magic, or one of the conclusions I've come to with magic, because and we can talk about this as well, because I mean, I did get involved in a lot of magical practice and some okay. actual groups from the on the back of of getting involved with Coil and Current ninety three and things like that. And for me, one of the one of the the, the key things about magic is magic longs to cure yourself of magic. <laughs> I think that's ultimately what magic asks of you. And one of the big things for me was coming to that conclusion that what magic really wants you to do is to step out the other side of magic. Magic wants to show you that there really is no need of magic because magic is already happening without anyone sort of bringing it into existence. But to come to that conclusion, you first need to practice ritual. You need to get involved in ritual and see what happens, you know, judge it by its results. And then if that ritual happens, what you start to do is reduce your rituals to smaller and smaller rituals to virtually everything you do is a ritual. Mm. I think once you get to that point, you've been cured yourself of magic and came out the other side of it. And this is something I would also have conversations with, especially with John Balance, in a way, who longed to cure himself of magic, but in a way, Balance was kind of addicted to magic. What do you mean by that? He couldn't give up. I mean, he couldn't give it up and he, he felt that he needed to sustain a magical practice just to sustain himself. And he sort of became, he sort of became John Balance, you know, and he felt that was something he had to maintain and sort of almost perform in a way. And I think magic can also become a sort of crutch. I mean, we know the sort of people that, you know, throw a tarot spread before they can really make a decision about anything really, yeah, yeah. you know? And it become a street. It can also become a strange form of addiction. And I think it's no coincidence that so many people who are involved in magic also tend to be often struggling with addictions. Yes, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, that that's been my experience as well. Magic really does have kind of like a disenchanting effect. It just you know disenchants everything in your life eventually until it's just everything is kind of flat. Uh, but then that's liberating in a way, in a strange way. I don't know. It's, I, you put you put it better than me. Yeah, you say it's you say it becomes kind of flat. But what I liked with the was well, the withdrawal of magic from my life was it was really freeing in the way I one I was able to experience awe because you realize that whatever is going on. I mean, the big lessons I I I've I've drawn from from magical practice, and I don't know if this is artistic practice or where one begins and one ends, because for me, writing my books feels like a sort of magical thing as well. But one of the things that maybe the lessons that I drew from magical practice and from being involved with all of these groups is that there is no individual existence. Hmm. There is no person doing anything and there is no such thing as free will. And these things are kind of quite terrifying and frightening, but ultimately totally liberating because if all that stuff is true, then you can just kind of sit back. There's no <laughs> ego being squeezed in the middle that's making all this happen. You know, there is no necessity to be the maker. But sometimes like when you're involved in magic, one of the pits you can fall in is you, you start to believe that you are the maker. Yes. And this is what I mean by being addicted to the magic like balance. It's almost like you feel like you're the monk who has to pray in the cave forever in order to keep the world turning. But it's really, the, the truth is the opposite. Interesting. That's very interesting. So what is the opposite truth? I mean, how did you, this, well, tell me the story of how you went through this kind of revelation of, of that's a very interesting image of the monk in the cave so that sounds like maybe well, that was a turning point in your life it's hard to say one of the interesting things i mean I, i've never kept a diary and, and i never i never mind a magical diary i just don't keep diaries for various reasons um but i kind of wish that i did because i find it very hard to remember timelines or when i was involved with this or when i was involved with that and i i definitely came to a point in my life where I felt that I'd cured myself of magic. I was no longer questing. I was no longer looking for anything. I had developed a form of, of what I would describe as faith. Mm. And that form of faith transcends any particular belief. In other words, I do not need the world to go in any particular way to prove or disprove anything. I have an implicit faith that everything is right and that I'm completely tied up on everything that happens anyway. and. Where did that come from? I don't know. 
was the was the OTO important to me, Alistair Crowley's order? I was involved in the OTO for over a decade. Hmm. Um, um, so I can't take I can't say if that particular experience it, it got me to where I am now, but it was certainly on the way there. It was certainly important for me. I mean, I did Resh, which is um, Crowley's mm -hmm. uh, source, you know, son ritual. I did that religiously, you know, four times a day, probably for more than a decade. You know, did that have an effect? I, I don't know. But then at the same time, I've always, I was part of a, you know, I was definitely a bit of a spiritual dilettante in a way. You know, I was part of a Sufi order. Mm. I was initiated in a Sufi order for a little bit, which was really powerful and that was you know, amazing meditations. Um, I grew up going to church. Um, I rediscovered that as an as an older man. I now attend Coral Even Song and Mass quite a lot as well. Mm. Um, so it's hard to say which of these things was the transformer of moment. To be honest, I I, I might and and we're talking about English Head in Reverse and not my, my other career as as a novelist, but I think perhaps what put the seal on, on that kind of spiritual epiphany that I had that didn't happen, but it was gradual, it didn't happen in one, it wasn't one of these boom. You know, I had this experience and things. It was gra I gradually came to this very, very liberating uh, place. But I feel one of the ways I got there was creating art because when I wrote my books, when I wrote my novels, I really was aware that there was that that there was no I writing them. They felt dictated. They felt like books that were spoken literally out of the air. I feel even taking sort of um um. I mean, I'll take a check for them because you know I need to survive. But <laughs> even putting my name on them, sometimes I feel like, wow, the idea that it was David Keenan that wrote these books is kind of like a a, a a mad idea. And that's when I really felt I really had the experience that I guess that looks similar to meditating or things where you really feel that when I was writing those books, there was no me that, that I actually I, I completely disappeared and they, they, they were like a sort of um, Adjoining the dots of the universe, or, or more like a uh, uh, creating a song out of a moment or something, and so I think a combination of spiritual practice and artistic practice ended up sort of blowing my mind spiritually, and um, all these things that I investigated probably came from my involvement with these groups and with England's England's hidden hidden reverse. And that's really beautiful. I mean, and I can see another side. I mean, so I was in the OTO for quite a bit. And I'll, I'll be honest. I felt at the time I was getting very little from it, mm -hmm. not from philemic practice, but from being in the OTO. Sure, sure. And then how did you reconcile that? Did you just leave or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eventually, <laughs> if, I mean, I had so, I, I felt a loyalty to it because, I mean, I absolutely love Alistair Crowley's writings. And and yes, Crowley has been completely transformative in, in, in my life. It's funny that he has this, the, the dark occult a, a reputation, but Crowley really like made me fall back in love with life. I mean, it's so lusty and 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 and, and beautiful. One of the big things for me that, that Crowley did was love is the law. Uh, the idea, you know, he he redefined he redefines change uh, as love, and uh -huh. he makes you think. You, you see that the engine of change, which really is the engine of the universe, is love because everything is longing. In Crowley's system, everything is longing to be united with what it is not, which account, yes. literally accounts for change and redefines it as love. This sort of this sort of collapse, this, this sort of collapsing, this constant collapsing into the other, this constant longing for union with what you're not. I mean, what a gorgeous way to talk about the engine of reality, the engine of change. And I also love his idea about. Um, the swans, the swans, is, is there not joy in the endless winging? Which to me is, yes. is the aspect of faith that comes from Crowley because he's not, there's not a meaning, it means there's not a meaning to be found, to be uncovered except in the joy of endless winging. And these to me are, are beautiful concepts, you know, that really sort of re -sacralize the world while removing the need for magic. That's very beautiful. Well, maybe that's a good place to kind of think about the magician life cycle. Magician life cycle, because I think everyone who kind of goes through the current goes through in a slightly different but broadly similar way. And there do right. seem to be developmental stages. And maybe that's a good place to kind of go back to the eighties and and look at what was going on there. I mean, obviously, you've got people like Tibet and and Balance who are kind of going undergoing magical adolescence and finding themselves having. 
um, stepped out from Psychic TV. Um, but I was looking at this book again, and it's just like, fuck, like, you know, so many of these people are dead now. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, Genesis is 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 dead, you know, uh, Sleazy is dead. Um, uh, Balance is dead. And, you know, and it was just really sad to look at that as like this profound, beautiful musical scene that it, it is and cultural scene that had never come before and is never going to come again. And it's almost like you can't even... You know, it was so influential, but you can't even really see the influence anymore because things have just mm -hmm. become so much more gray and mundane uh, since yep. that time period. Um, but wow. I was also looking at this and it's just kind of like maybe something you can riff on is kind of, you know, what were the maturation processes of some of the people uh, in this scene? You mentioned drugs. You know, obviously there was, you know, some people died to drugs in this scene, balance. Um and then I was looking at this and it seems like the person that got out of this, ironically, the person that seems to have gotten out of this the least scathed, at least on the surface, appears to be David Tibet, who just became a Christian. And that's not an ideological statement. It's just an, kind of an ironic observation. Yeah, I've got a lot to say. You know, there's, first of all, just quickly deal with that, with the David Tibet Christian thing. To me, that actually, that's one of the big letdowns for me, actually, is Tibet's mm. um, embracing of what seems to me a quite mean-spirited uh, Christianity, actually. You thought, it was mean, a, you thought it was mean-spirited in his case? I think it's, I think it's embracing of the, the particular Christianity that he embraces huh. as a mean-spirited version. It's a very, it's big, it should come as no surprise if you're a fan of Card 93, but it's big on judgment. It's yeah. big on who will be judged and it's big on sin, you know, to me, which which I find there's a total intellectual and spiritual abdication. That's interesting. And I think it makes for in increasingly uninteresting Card 93 records that they really just repeat themselves about Satan, Christ and judgment again and again and again. I find it hectoring and I find it um, mm. spiritually... Um, I don't know, just mean, kind of mean. Do you think that so, was him just I, I, reacting? I, do you think that was him just reacting to the scene that he was in and kind of deciding to cast aspersions on people? I don't know. We, uh, no, I think, I, to be honest, I, I'm never going to denigrate the depth of anyone's belief, but um, I think there's always a little bit where Tibet is always sort of um, inhabiting a character to a certain degree. And so I think he kind of wants to be the guy that embraces a mean spirited Christianity, you know. I, 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 I'm not going to put any doubts on 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 the depth of his faith of his faith, but sometimes it seemed to me a little performative, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest. Okay. Um, um, and well, to me, it's like you know, stumbling from one ideology to another. To me, that's I think as an adult, if you describe yourself as an ist or you follow an ism. <laughs> Yeah. And you're still an adult. I mean, I I, I find I find you a little bit laughable and I'm probably a little <laughs> pathetic, actually. You know, I think you, you grow these isms and ists. And I don't I understand crutches and I understand people having that. I, I, I'm not I, 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 yeah, I understand that. But as an adult freed from systems of thought, to me, a lot of the rituals that, that they went through, especially in psychic TV and things like that, were really to sort of free you. From, from any kind of ideology or to being the victim of someone else's ideas, you know? And for me, the world is so sick with ideas now. Yeah. And I find people at the end of their life still embracing ideas. I find it kind of depressing. But at the it same is. time, you know, so John Balance did die very young from alcoholism and, and, and alcohol abuse, certainly. And there's two sides to that. There's one side to where it was really fucking tragic and it was very sad to see and he was a desperate alcoholic near the end of his days. I visited Coyle and I stayed with him in their house at Western Supermare for a period of time when Balance was drinking very badly. Um, there was no joy. It wasn't like he was just getting fucked up and having a mad time and he just loved, you know, intoxication. It was tears and destruction and yeah. falls and injuries and it, it was really tragic. Um, and in a way, they really had everything. In that house in Western Supermare, you should have seen the library. You should have seen the art collection, original Crowley paintings, original Charles Sims paintings mm. on all the walls, a collection of the first editions of all the magical books you could ever have dreamt of reading. And I always remember one sa sad morning. In a way, I kind of liked living with them because it sort of bust a lot of the myths about, about magicians in general because they would literally 
sat around in their pyjamas watching <laughs> Ready Steady Cook on, on, on daytime TV. And, and I do always remember a little bit of a sad moment when Balance had ordered some, he was on a, a particular jag for a, a, a um, um, I can't remember his name off the top of head. I saw a, bar, a bardic English poet who he was who he was collecting all the first editions by. And in the morning, he received a new first edition and he sort of burst it open from the, the package and he flicked through it. And then he sort of threw it to one side and it landed on the floor and it slid behind a curtain. And, and I remember thinking that book will never be retrieved or read. You know, there was just a sort of, a, a sort of and they were living in this paradise. But somehow, you know, balance was so, that's alcoholism for you. But at the same time, this is the price that, that Balance and Sleazy agreed to pay. They, like Burroughs, and like some of their heroes before them, they were cosmonauts who went out as far as they could in order to report back. And these are the risks of the territory. These are the risks that, can, that come with that kind of extreme reportage. So I'm a sorry that Balance died young. Well, well, on one hand, it's a tragedy. But on the other hand, John Balance was John Balance completely. And he died as John Balance and he lived the life that John Balance was supposed to live. So it's, it's hard to mourn in yeah. one sense. Well, what do you think actually happened there, maybe in a just in a more human sense? I mean, why why was he drinking so much? It can't have just it, it can't just have been side effects of the occult, just in the same way that Crowley's no. drug addiction really doesn't have anything to do with the occult. I mean, what were there unresolved issues there? Was what what else well, was knows? going I mean, on? Does that have something to do with the occult? I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um at, at my worst, um, when I was I wrote a novel called Monument Maker. It took me 10 years. Um, and at my worst, and it could have been for a combination of art and occult ritual, but um, I was I was experiencing literally voices in my head, mm -hmm. literally voices in my head to the point where I had to use banishing acts. The thing about banishing acts, the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram and things that magicians use, is that artists don't know or don't have equivalent banishing yes. ritual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, know? that's a very important. That's a very important point. Yeah, it's really, it really is, and that's why I was yeah. sending me over around the bend because I was working in art without having an artistic version of a of a banishing act. So I had to literally um, develop that. And one of the things that I did to develop this banishing act was I don't. I, I stopped allowing thoughts about my work to be taken seriously unless I was working. Hmm. So when these voices started happening, I would say, no, I'm not interested. I'm not even going to note you down. You have no, you, you you don't get to talk to me right now. Get back to me when I'm working, if you've got something to say. And if I forget what you said, then what you were saying was of no interest to me. And that's another <laughs> like faith that. thing. You know, yeah. So only yeah. when I sit down, do I, I, I give them space. And I had to sort of um, develop that. And so these kind of rituals are... I mean, they're really important. They're yeah. really important, I yeah. think. But what was what, where, what was the question? Why was I bringing up the... Uh, the question was, what what was going on with balance outside mm -hmm. of, you know, in a more human okay. sense? Uh, what, yeah. were, were there unresolved issues? Like, like what, what, yeah, I'm sure what happened there? Yeah, but well, he had a, a, a difficult upbringing, military family, military background, all boys school. So many of these people were at all boys schools mm -hmm. and... And certainly, I I I had a trauma from a young age, for, probably because of that. In many cases, but what? But if you want to like really talk about the specifics of why Balance was drinking that badly, I honestly believe, because he told me a few times, and because of my own experience, it makes sense that the amount of ecstasy that Balance took during the, you know the acid house years mm -hmm. when when Coil. And yeah, that's one thing I've gone back to. You know, I've I had my own acid house epiphany later in life, and I've really come to love coil dance music. Oh yeah, probably more than I even gave them credit for in the book. I actually think that stuff has aged so fucking well. Phenomenally, yeah, Shit, absolutely, like the snow, absolutely. The snow or stuff like that. Yeah, NASA yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Oh, oh shit, it's amazing. It's so good. It's so good. Um, yeah. But they were he they were total disco bunnies at the time, and they did so much ecstasy. The balance believed that he had damaged his brain 
using ecstasy and MDMA. And one of the reasons he was drinking so hard was to quell the kind of anxious mania of his brain brought on by probably dopamine burnout. Okay. Too much MDMA. And you know what? I can understand that. I went through, I definitely went through my own uh, ecstasy romance and my own use of MDMA. And I can't, and I felt on a smaller level how that could be possible. Definitely after a major um, ecstasy weekend, I would be, uh, I would definitely was drinking to sort of medicate anxious come downs. Now, I think if I'd done a decade of that, I can kind of imagine where my brain might be at. Yeah. So I think you've got a combination of, of, of trauma, a combination of getting out there via occult ritual, which can definitely disturb the brain. I know that myself. And overuse, overstimulation of the brain with drugs. And I'll throw in one other thing. And Cozy Fanny Tutti mentions this in the book. And I think there's a truth to it because I saw it myself. I think when they moved from London to Weston Supermare, which is a really sleepy retirement town. They had a lovely, massive, big mansion there, but there was fuck all we do. They were bo- balance was bored out of his mind, mm. and you know, Sleazy could could occupy himself. Sleazy is capable of playing, you know, an online role playing game for eight hours. <laughs> what game? What drop. game? What game was that? I can't remember. They kept, he kept playing this game where it, I don't know any about computer games since fucking ZX Spectrums. <laughs> no, since Sonic the Hedgehog, I'll, 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 that's what I'll cut yeah. off. But so I couldn't really tell you what it was like, but it seemed to be a game where it was like a multiplayer adventure game where you're walking across this landscape, maybe on another planet. Sleazy was really into like planetary graphics as well as you get from a like you know, music to play in the dark. He was generating all these, his own planets and things. Mm. And wow. I just remember that he spent like eight hours one day, he told me walking across a desert in a computer game. And after eight hours, he met another player. And he said he got such a fucking fright to meet this other player after eight hours. And I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> he walked across a virtual desert for eight hours? <laughs> But he had that kind of manic obsession. He always seemed to be occupying himself. I mean, on the one hand, I'm sort of I'm sort of demystifying Coyle by saying they sat about in their pajamas watching Ready Steady Cook. But that adds to it for me. I think but so. On the other hand, you would occasionally see, like I remember one day, so they lived in this, they bought this old boys' school that Haile Selassie had once lived in. And it had this own elevator up to the top floor. It was a mad, mad place. And I just remember one day walking through the hall, the hall where Balance actually died because... He fell from the top floor place onto the marble floor of the bottom floor. And I remember walking across that hall and Peter Christofferson Sleazy came out of a, of a room, turned very purposely, closed the door of the room, walked across the hall into another room and closed the door. And he was wearing an apron covered in blood. With no, you know, no explanation. I never oh, even Jesus. asked. <laughs> but you would always feel like Sleazy was always fucking up to something and probably up to something pretty weird most of the day, where his balance just seemed bored out of his mind and waiting to start drinking. Okay. So I think the isolation of Western Superbear, and in a way, maybe they had to, they, or they believed they had to move to there to stay alive, but ultimately, Cody certainly believes that that's, that was the final nail in balance coffin, in a way. Interesting. Yeah, now I'm trying to figure out what's <laughs> about the apron. I mean, what, what else was he getting up to there? Well, I don't know. Well, you know, I mean, one of the early things was that one of the things he did was he 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 he, he did the makeup for some of the things and uh, some of the gruesome exhibitions in the London Dungeon, and then he has those early amazing shots they did of of like men being assaulted, and um, he was good at like you know setting up like fake murder scenes and things. Mm-hmm. So it half occurred to me is that fake blood. Is he doing some sort of mad secret installation? They definitely had rooms of like ru- like rubber covering everything, so you could easily splash a lot of blood around. So <laughs> who knows? And then you could half your like, are they? Is it a slight performance? Am I getting this because they know I'm writing about them? Who knows? But but I mean, what I'm saying, even the most mundane aspects of that visit were pure coil magic for me in a way. Huh, how long were you there? Um, not that long, maybe about maybe about a week. Okay. I sort of stayed with him. I always remember the whole time I was sleeping in this room and I had this fucking glow-in-the-dark upside-down cross that you couldn't turn off. 
<laughs> you know? So even when I was sleeping, I felt like there was an upside down cross on the back of my eyelids. It's just this fucking weird place. I remember talking to actually Mark, Mark Pilkington when I was in the UK and I think 2004 and we were, this is when balance was still alive. And he was saying, um, that one of the things with balance is that he was basically a kept man and that sleazy kind of paid for everything and he'd never had, a, had to have a job and that that was really not good for him. That he hadn't had to develop all of that. Yeah. I don't think it's good for anyone. Yeah. You know, I mean, everyone should have to have their, you know, to have something that fulfills them and something that they do and something that helps them structure their day. I think that is uh, really important. But yeah, you're right. I mean, he was a kept man. He was a kept man. I mean, and they lived in absolute style. And um, Sweezy was a brilliant cook. I mean, he, he, he cooked me, I mean, all these weird things that I'm remembering. But I mean, he, he cooked me probably the best roast chicken that I have ever eaten in my life. Hmm. One, of, like, one of my big regrets is that I didn't ask him the fucking recipe. Because I think about that roast chicken to this day, even the next day, they made like sandwiches. The sandwiches were just so fucking good, you know? <laughs> it's just weird amazing. the things that you remember, you know? That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, Sleazy was clearly, you know, a, a, a genius, I think, and a technical genius. Yep. And yep. Hoyle now, I mean... It's interesting when after they after they died, there was a period where no one talked about Coil. But I think with younger people, they've kind of taken on this legendary saintly status, like a, as they should. But I don't think that yep. particularly the stuff that they recorded later, um, like the, kind of the Moon Music period, that stuff has never been surpassed. That's there's nothing has come close to that since. It's it stands completely unique, and that's a. I mean, if I think about it now, that's an almost impossible feat in music. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jason, I'm going to shiver up my spine just talking about that. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, to me, like, late period Coil is the best shit. Yeah. I mean, that band reinvented himself again and again, but the last stuff, the last music they made is, you're right, peerless, unparalleled. Yeah. It was in so many sort of, like, divergent strands from, like, prog rock to gay disco um, but yet being completely unique. Also, I think the series of uh, Moon's Milk mm -hmm. recordings that they recorded during the solstice and the equinox, and I've got Bill Breeze, obviously, Hi, my name is Beta from the OTO on, on Viola. That music is pure magic. And, and, then, and then you've got something like the New Backwards. Yeah. I mean, I think the ultimate coil track, ultimate coil track is going up, which is po a posthumous coil mm -hmm. track, which mm -hmm. uses what it balances final a gig which is Balance's final concert with Coil, where he starts to sing the theme tune from Very Camp, BBC uh, 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 series Are You Being Served? Yeah. And as Sleazy turns it into just the most beautiful elegy, the most incredible religious music, the greatest memory of the ascension of Balance. Um, but yet, still, it's really Camp. It's still can't, but yet it's <laughs> profoundly serious and moving. How did yeah. he do that? Complete magic. So yeah, those late recordings were just, yeah, that's, that's what Coyle were about for me. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a sad quote in the book. Early on, Bowen says something like, it was a very nihilistic scene and we could just have destroyed ourselves, but somehow we turned that energy around and we made something creative and affirmative from it. And they did. They did. Regardless they, yeah. of the fact of Balance's young death, they did. That music is still affirmative of life, you know, and affirmative of maybe a life that burned up very quickly, that supernova. That I don't believe those lives are any lesser. I don't believe we measure life in that kind of span. I would like to measure life in intensity. Mm. You know, I totally still believe in that other line from Alistair Crowley, you know, the only sin is restriction. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the only sin is to be less than life, you know, and the coil were never less than life. Yeah, they really did it. And I think that that music is immortal and it is sacred music and it, it should be remembered as such. I mean, and, and so the thing about listening to that stuff now that I have a bit more musical knowledge also, it's just like, I mean, like, what do you even compare to that? You can go back to, you know, Krautrock and Popova yeah. or something like that. But even that does not come as beautiful as it is does not come close. And the other thing is like, you listen to some of that stuff and you just have no idea how they made it. I don't think you could reverse engineer whatever Sleazy was, was doing in that late period. 
No, and he also had that concept which comes out of Austin Osman's Osman's spear of the sidereal sound. Mm -hmm. You know, so they had this way, this production style that was sidereal, which literally means I think we all the stars guided by the stars. And to me, that's that's a sonic version of the prophetic book. You know, with Blake and and, and the Book of the Law mm -hmm. by Crowley. And, and what I came to understand, I was talking earlier on about my own experience of of, of prophetic books and and Coyle's prophetic music. And what what what, what I, I came to realize prophetic means is it doesn't mean uh, telling the future. It means spoken out of the air. You know, where you uh, dictated like the Book of the Law is one of the best dictated texts ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I is agree. William, as are William Blake's books. Yeah, as is late Coyle music. That's what it, it sounds like. It is beamed from somewhere else, you know. And, and they would often talk about themselves as being sort of channels and vessels. And to me, when people start using that language, you know you're dealing with the real deal. You know you're dealing if, with if someone they're like actually that. doing it, and they're not just on yeah. in at a festival, you know. <laughs> yeah, this is a genuine magical experience because that's the it's, that's what it feels like, and that's how you report it back when you feel caught up in what in, in what is speaking in the moment. And of course, as I was talking early on, first you use ritual to get in that space, but eventually you cure yourself of ritual and magic because you realize that everything is speaking all the time. And so I think that the solstice and equinox rituals that Coyle did is precisely that. You 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 ritualize it, you get into a space because we're used to the equinox or the solstice speaking. That speaks, it's significant. It's so much significance that everyone feels the potential for the universe to speak on those days. Mm. But the reality is the universe is speaking every minute. So we even get that development in Coyle where they, they go beyond that ritual. And the way that Sleazy somehow brings back that, let's face it, drunken performance mm -hmm. by Balance when he's singing the theme tune to this crappy camp TV show because he's so fucked up, we can't be realise that there too the universe was speaking with such articulacy in the moment and I think that's what magic this is what the best thing that magic can do for you ultimately is to teach you to pay attention because this is what ritual does because if you do a ritual you know I'm not I, I was never really interested in results based magic I was always interested in sort of epiphany based magic you know uh, uh, um, but one of the great things that, rit that, that, that results based magic teaches you is attention because if you if you do like one of those you know, one of those Austin Osman spear sigils or whatever, and you dispose of it, but you have a sort of um, an end goal in mind, you watch the universe really closely for that result, for a sign of that result, hmm. and you really start to read it as if the universe speaks. And in a way, these are the sort of bluffs I think that the Western mind needs in order to get to the point that, that the world is speaking. Because I think one of the early... Uh, um, one of the big pratfalls of magical culture, of magical practice, sorry, and especially for even a lot of the musicians in England's head in reverse, is the idea that you're going to be gifted something. Yeah. You're going to gain something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something that is not already present. You know what I mean? Like your reality is, yeah. going to, you're going to go up 10, your reality is going to like, you're going to gear it up 10 times more than it is right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's not true. Because what you're looking for is already present in the pre-magically articulated moment, in a way. And I guess that's what I mean when I keep going back to one of the biggest failures to cure yourself of magic. Because you you keep thinking that the necessity is there, that there's some there has to be someone there keeping this shit going. You know? Whereas the reality is the, the gift is to step into the moment without any need to do anything. I like how you... I like how you say that the Western mind needs that because when you're saying that, I mean, okay, well, theoretically, you can just go do some Eastern practice or non-dualism or something like that, but that's not nearly as cool as magic. And I think coming to that conclusion through the magical process, it's like you really, I think it's interesting. I'm thinking of this as you're saying it. I think really do think there is something about whatever we want to call it, Western consciousness that is quest based. It's kind of got that Arthurian, yep. you got to pull the sword from the stone and go through all these stages and come back at the end and do the hero's journey. Um, that seems to be hardwired. I don't think you can really get around that, nor would you necessarily want to because it, it leads to a lot of awesome life experiences. 
hundred percent. But you can kind of blow the circuitry ultimately. Mm. You you can definitely do that. Um but I think in the context of what we're talking about, actually, one of the one of the things that yeah, you're right, it's more kind of fun. Well, cult ritual <laughs> is fun. It's way Ritualizing. more fun, way more fun. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but that's a lesson you can take to every aspect in your life, and that's what I mean by paying attention. You know, you can shovel a fucking subway sandwich into your mouth as you're walking down the street on your way to your meeting, or you can take an hour out in your afternoon light some candles, cook yourself an amazing meal with a little glass of wine and just make every experience better. To me, that's what kind of ritual's about and magic's about. It means you bring that quality of attention to everything that you do and then you're rewarded. You're rewarded with a sort of... You are rewarded with a sort of depth of experience. You're still in the same reality. You're just paying more attention to the magical nuance of it. But again, I love rock and roll. I love rock and roll. My preferred ritual is a gig with an amazing band who are in the zone kicking off. I prefer that to a fucking 30-day silent retreat. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. That's where I find my epiphanies. And I think back to why, why, was the, why, why is this so efficacious, the magic of coil and, and all of these groups throbbing grass? So why, why are they so tr- immediately sort of transformative in your life? And one of the things is, I believe that rock and roll is 100% modern-day shamanism. Mm-hmm. 100%. The rock and roll style... When it's the rock good. When, level, it's, when it's good. Goods. Yeah, when it's good. When it's yeah, good. Yeah. When, they're, when the band is peaking and everyone's in the zone and you have that egoless experience where you are the damn music and the entire crowd is moving as one and you're dissolved and you're dissolved into the ritual celebration of being alive in this moment. Because one of the big things, again, about magic is it wakes you up to the only place where magic can happen is right now. Mm-hmm. The moment is necessary for any moment of epiphany. And any moment of epiphany that has ever taken place has taken place right now, not in the future and not in the past. And that's what rock and roll, that's what uh, industrial music, that's what the great post-punk bands, when I went to gigs, I had that experience. It was exactly the same thing as I get from going to church. Mm. I felt I was not I was in some kind of presence of a sacrament, a presence of a, a, a of a holy ritual, and I had that mind blowing non dual experience where I was no longer someone outside of the scene experiencing it. The music and whoever I was was the one damn thing unfolding, and there was no other reality aside from that. So you're right. For me, it's the best fun in town. Absolutely. I mean, one of my friends once, dis- you know, after hearing Coil for the first time, described it as a, a church service in hell, which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> but I, I always remember an interesting thing, though, and I think there is a point to it. I always remember a group called Sun City Girls, mm-hmm. um, Sir Richard Bishop and Alan Bishop. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, um, I do like some of the records. Um, sometimes I can find them a little cheesy and, and their interviews sometimes can really do your head in. But I, I remember one kind of good point that I remember Richard Bishop, I think he was played, I think they played him Coil, a track by Coil, for a feature on The Wire, which I think is called uh, Invisible Jukebox. So you play tracks and, and you've kind of got to, you've kind of got to try and guess who they are, and then you riff on talking about them. And Richard Bishop, was he was a, a, a dealer in rare magical books. So, I mean, I'm sure he knows his shit. But um, they played him Coil. And I can't remember if he liked it or not, but he did make quite a, I thought, quite a, a good point. He kind of said, you know, the thing that always got to me about Coil was they, they were always too overtly banging on about the fact that they were magicians. And he was like, isn't one of the key sort of rules and lessons, uh, you know, to know, to will, to dare, and to keep silent? Yeah, but nobody does that. <laughs> Crowley <laughs> did it. Nobody follows that. Because <laughs> the but other thing what, is, but, if, but if you keep silent, then it dies. Nobody gets to find out about it. But I, yeah, to a certain degree, but I think that keeping silent is exactly the final step in what I'm talking about in terms of curing yourself of magic. Because... I think, I mean, and I think this relates to the magician card and in, in, in the tarot also. I think there is a reason that one of the most elementary powers of the magician is invisibility. Because yeah. 
I think if you announce yourself as a fucking magician all the time, you can never be invisible. You cannot move in every area of society invisibly. In other words, you fall into the pit of identity yeah. and then you identify yourself as something different from everyone else. That was always my beef. Not my beef, but my one thing that I had when Alan Moore would always describe himself, not even describe himself as a magician, he kind of looks like I am a magician. You know what I mean? And I always feel like, mate, what happened to invisibility? You walk into every situation as I am a magician. I would like to think I can move in loads of different circles without being a sort of I am a magician type guy. And I think that's the real magic. Yeah, that's you realize what, what you, I, you, you, your reality, wherever you are, whoever you're interacting with is essentially you. But if you walk into every situation as I am a magician, you're kind of saying I am essentially different <laughs> from every other situation. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, there's a there's a public persona and a private persona, and, and I remember asking Genesis about this one time, and you know, I've I've gone back and forth in that in my life. There's times I've been very visible, times I've been completely invisible, and there's a lot more power in being being invisible in in a lot of ways. Um, but Crowley talks about this in Liber B, where he says, you know, at a certain point, you kind of have to start talking about it. And I asked I asked Jen about this at one point, and she said, well. Because I was really paranoid in the early 2000s, it was after during the Iraq War, and you know, I was just kind of in this early paranoid stage. That, like, oh, if I talk mm-hmm. about this, the Inquisition is going to come after me, and all of this. And Jen said, "Well, you know, there's another way to do it, which is she called it dazzle camouflage, which is just you make yourself so ridiculous in as I think Jen did in the public eye, and so clownish that everyone overlooks you." I think. Well, that I think that's brilliant, and I actually think that's another way of yeah of dealing with invisibility. Mm-hmm. There are two ways of doing it. Stand, standing out so completely is almost another way of kind of invisibility. Hiding in plain sight. Yeah. And I mean, when I say invisibility, I mean, we're talking, I'm talking about this pretty openly. And actually, I talk about, you know, because I also, you know, exist in another more mainstream sort of literary world that, that knows nothing really about our culture when with a lot of the people who interview me. And I, and I bring it up. I bring it up because I like to set those seeds because those seeds, again, were important to me. So I feel a sort of duty, in a way, to to keep seeding this information because it certainly got me to where I am. But then there's a whole other side of my life where nobody would have any idea that I am in any way was ever involved with the occult or even what the fuck the occult is, you know? Well, the good thing about modern whatever whatever this moment we're in is nobody really has a stable identity anymore i mean you play so many roles you know you can play so many roles online and everyone is so fractured in their attention anyways that i don't think it's quite the same as hiding from the catholic church in the 18th century anymore i mean people are, people's brains are you know people forget you can just see it with the news you know you can have the most shocking news story and then it's forgotten 24 hours later so i think that's actually quite a good period for magicians because like you know people are wigging out about all this apocalyptic stuff they could care less that people are running around talking about magic you know it's just not does not register to them i think yeah well i think one of the big things that magic could do i think magic is the, is the ultimate cure to even identity politics because i mean to me that i said it earlier on to me the greatest stumbling block to suck to revelation or to to or to sort of um getting in tune with the world is identity yeah. It's identity politics. It's identifying yourself as different from other from other experiences. It's entering other experiences in a sort of hostile way. And, and that, that that's the sort of downfall of ideas in a way. And that, this is what occult practice did for me. It just yeah. blew that idea up. That I had any fixed identity that I was this or that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was this all that crap. I constantly get it because the literary world is not, uh, there's very few working class people in the literary world. Mm-hmm. So people often ask me, well, what is it like to be a working class writer? And that kind of thing. And I totally refuse all that crap. You know, <laughs> I don't fall back on any of that. And I think that's what a magical sort of background teaches you. You know? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think, you know, this a long protracted study of magic very much prepared me for the current 
fragmented era. But I, I think even I've said this a lot, even the basic Robert Anton Wilson idea of reality tunnels is something that p- people have completely yep. forgotten about. And they're locked into I, I do think people are becoming more and more rigidly identified with the physical world, which is very bad and more and more rigidly identified with ideology and just digging their heels in on positions that they didn't think through and they didn't come up with in the first place. Um, and that's a, that's a, you know, that's never led to good things in history. Well, it's interesting for you. You talked about the physical, for me, the physical world is, for me, the physical world is, is it in a way. I, I don't really believe in a sort of, um, that behind m- m- the physical fact of me, there is a second ghost me who is the real me. I, I believe and I think Antonin Artaud is another person mm. who cured himself of magic. But the thing I love about Artaud, and especially his late period writings, is the, the, the primacy of the body, the, the, the primacy of the physical fact. I mean, I believe the body is, is heaven. I believe that the, the incarnation, uh, that's what I like about, that's the thing that I love about, about Christianity, is the, in, the, the incarnation of the body I, I believe that's heaven. I believe things are tied up with physicality. And I think it's interesting because loads of secular people will, will, will always describe, will always say things like, well, the real me, the inner me, yeah. the soul, as if there's a ghost, as if there's a strange, there's a ghost in the machine, there's a ghost behind the physical body that's animating it and is the real you. To me, that seems like a mad, a, a, a mad belief. It almost seems it's a mad belief they would they would accuse religious people or occultists of holding in a way. But I don't really be, I don't believe in a sort of second me. In fact, I don't even believe in a firm thing behind me. I mean, as I'm speaking right now, there's not a second me formulating these sentences, thinking them up, and then saying them to you. They are literally happening. Yeah, you know. I think when you talked about that sort of disenchantment earlier on, I think that's what I'm kind of meaning. I, I no longer require a world behind this one. Yeah, I get you. I guess what I'm what I'm saying with um, identified with materials, just I, I, adopting a completely fixed and, and rigid um, self. But it is interesting, kind of as you're saying that. It's like you know, I I particularly now, it's like I walk around in the world and I talk to people and supposedly rational people, and everyone just seems very superstitious to me. And they yeah. have un, unthought through beliefs and they haven't. Um, and, and I think I agree with you completely. It's like the, the, the great thing. Well, one way that I put it is, you know, a stage magician produces enchantment or produces illusion, but a real, a real magician takes the illusions away until all that is, it's, it's you sitting here breathing, <laughs> observing whatever this is. Um, and being okay with the fact that there's no special effects budget to reality. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like I was saying earlier, it's extremely liberating because you no longer feel that it's it's down to you. I think there's a terrible burden that people have that they believe it's somehow down. Yeah. It's down to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. Of the, you know, somehow there's a sort of, there's a really tight, like a tight fist, like a, it's a feel of like squeezing your brain. There's a sort of tightness at the center of the world, which is the you that's responsible. For all, which is it was complete insanity. I mean, did you think up your parents? Did you decide when and where you would be born? There was no responsibility there whatsoever. I don't know what I mean, I, and then it sounds crazy, but but I think almost walking out any of the into the world with any belief whatsoever <laughs> is wrong. Is faulty. Yeah. It's never going to be the whole story. And that's an amazing liberating thing. And you know, I read occult literature still to this day, but I read it more now like really good literature or like brilliant poetry. You know, I'm not looking for it to provide any kind of answer anymore. I, I don't use any kind of daily ritual anymore. I enjoy it for the fun of it, for the language of it, for the culture of it, but I, I, I'm not looking for any answers. And I think one of the, the, the brilliant metaphors for this, which is so genius, is um, is the, the science fiction writer uh, Douglas Adams, who mm-hmm. wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, etc. And there's a moment in Hitchhiker's Guide where um, they, they find this supercomputer 
and they ask the supercomputer the meaning of life, universe, the universe and everything. Uh-huh. And it calculates it and responds and it says 42. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that is genius it, it because is. that is exactly what, what could you what could possibly be an answer to the meaning of life. That's what they're going to get out of all this AI once it once they have it fully calculating. It's going to spit back forty two. <laughs> <laughs> it totally is. It totally is. But it makes a sort of, a, a sort of mockery of, of the idea of an answer or an explanation. You know, and um, how is that possible? How there can be no expl- explanation to us. Because we are literally it. We are it. Yeah. So you cannot take a reading of who we are because we are it. You know? Yeah. This is mad. So I mean, Jason, this is a crazy conversation because all these revelations essentially came from discovering a band called Throb and Gristle. (laughs) Yes. You know, if you chase it all back, I mean, this is this is where the uh, this is this is where we end up. And that is really incredible. And it really shows you how kind of like explosive and incendiary and, and exciting and, and and revelatory that period of culture was and I, yeah I absolutely guess, i mean it's another turning know? it's a turning of the wheel i mean it's like and, and it was so it was so potent and maybe this is a good time to kind of wind the clock back to that one one moment in in looking through this again one moment that i want to ask you about is the moment where kind of throbbing gristle ended and psychic t kind of everyone was in psychic tv and then in my mind there was this bifurcation point in the entire scene where part of you know part of the scene went with genesis to do topi and kind of um it was a much more experimental thing but another side particularly coil went off and did and david tibet went off and did their own thing and did not want to concretize anything um, maybe talk about that a little bit, because I think even in the context of what we're saying, uh, there's definitely points along the journey where you're kind of offered these moments where you can maybe, I don't know, clamp down on it more than you should, or, uh, there's always a temptation to form a dogma out of something. And I don't think that Topi actually did that, but there was clearly a danger there. And Jen was obviously aware of that. And, and ended up stepping away and cured herself of magic, I think, to some extent. But maybe talk about that point and and that bifurcation. Yeah, that was that was a key. That's a key moment, actually, Jason. You're totally right. And one of those that moment is, and you can totally see this in terms of um, occult initiation or spiritual initiation. That moment when that split happened was the moment where you literally need to kill your idols or you need to step away from the guru. And Genesis was the guru and definitely set herself up yep. as a guru. I mean, this the whole guru thing appealed to Jen 100%. It has no interest in me. I would never have any interest in followers. I can't think of anything worse. But Jen, Jen certainly loved that. And um, I know for a fact David Tibet definitely felt early on that he was in Jen's shadow. Definitely. How so? And he had... Um, when Genesis even named him. I mean, he gave him the name David Tibet. Mm-hmm. You know, because because Tibet was very interested in uh and Tibet and shit, you know. So Jen said, Well, I'm gonna call you David Tibet. And 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 Tibet was definitely in, um obsessed and, and besotted by Jen early on. And Jen was very influential in what Tibet read and what he was involved in. But then we had the the inevitable. A rebellion against that. And I remember when I interviewed Jen for England's Head in Reverse, and Tibet was immediately on the phone to me, like, what did she say? What did she say about me? <laughs> was she nice? And he and he was definitely relieved that Jen was like, Jen was very nice about him. And he was definitely relieved about that. But I, I, he seemed quite vulnerable then. He was then I could definitely see how much Jen's opinion mattered to him and also how much it took to sort of break away from that. And also with a, a, a balance as well. They go elsewhere. And to be honest with you, I do think Psychic TV, I do think the Temple of Psychic Youth did solidify into a cult with its own... Re- I okay. think any cult that gets people to look the same, I'm not into that. Sure. That's a hardening of identity. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't movie, around during that era either. I came I, I, I met Genesis in the in the 2000s after all of this had ended. So I, I, I wasn't, I didn't see any of that firsthand. But even like the topi haircuts, 
And to me, that was a sexual thing. That was just a sort of look. That was a sort of boys kind of look that, 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 that sleazy and, and, and Jen liked. Okay. You know what I mean? So they had all these boys kind of looking in their favourite style with a haircut. But even like the idea of having a temple haircut, I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't like that. But at the same time, you'll get someone like Ossian. You know, he's yeah, I met I met Ossian uh, briefly. Very very sweet guy. Oh, I mean, amazing person. And he eventually did. He eventually did have to get out of uh, of Topi because it was becoming too regimented. It was becoming too much. The ideas of one person, Genesis. Um, but at the same time, Ossian never denied the incredible effect that um, being in Topi had. He lived in a Topi commune and. And I love that idea, that magic. I, I love that. I will live by the rules of art. I understand that. There's that amazing Angus McLeese, who there's yeah. all these connections here. Angus McLeese is in the book. Angus yeah. McLeese also recorded with Bill Breeze in the 70s. In fact, their stuff just came out in an Angus McLeese box set, which has got Bill Breeze playing with Angus McLeese. I remember Bill playing me in his car as we were uh, driving around New York a long time ago. It's come out in a box set now. But Angus McLeese has this amazing... Amazing. I was original drummer for the Velvet Underground, but an amazing occultist, just a pure instinctive magician. And he has this uh, piece called Calendar. And what he does is for an entire year, he renames every day of the year with his own name. You know, like, you know, the day of the Thunderbolt Pagoda, the day of the, every, you know, I can't remember, but beautiful names. So every day has got a name. Wow. And um, I remember, um, Balance talking about that and Balance talking about how um, he tried to live by that for a little bit. And what that kind of shows you in a way is these kind of like, kind of these elemental acts of magic that if you remain loyal to and you live inside for a bit, will change your reality. I mean, imagine if it was the day of Thunderbolt Pagoda today and not July the whatever. <laughs> you would feel kind of different about the day. Yeah. And I think in the way that hardcore practice that Topi had of living according to these precepts is like living according to Angus McQuish's calendar. And for a period of time, it's worth doing and trying and seeing if your experience of reality does come different. And I think that, that Ossian always maintained that it did, that he was thankful for that experience. And I remember Jen describing him as maybe one of his most loyal Topi boys. And he really, he did it. He did the full ritual. And, and I can relate to that. You know, I get into magic. I get into anything. I've got to get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to yeah. do the shit. I'm not just going to read about it. I'm going to do the shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's interesting because, um, you know, you read accounts of like people who were in Chogyam Trungpa's group in the seventies or Adi Da or something like that, and like I've had I've I've gone on forums where there's people who were involved in these short lived, high intensity communal living magical situations, and they're still arguing to this day about whether you know was this an abusive cult was it not yeah. and you have one person saying you know one side saying this was this was all a mistake and then the other side saying like you completely missed the point and you never got the message and the thing that i always think is you know aren't, weren't you all adults at the time you decided to do it i mean I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up jason because i mean i mean i'm, I'm a massive chogion trumpa fan hmm. massive fan i think that um you know, cutting through spiritual materialism is one of the oh, greatest. Oh, it's a great book. Yeah, yeah. Or one of the greatest books right on spirituality. And what I love most about Chogyam Trungpa is that he's a guru that it's easy to cure yourself of because <laughs> he is so flawed, man. He is so flawed. My whole thing is, I want that's to. What, see that's what I like about Crowley as well. 100%. It's just like, Me too. Yeah. I want to see human gurus. I don't believe in superhuman. I believe. I believe we're all flawed. We're all yeah. human beings. I don't yeah. believe in superhumans. And I'm not looking for the example of a superhuman. I want to see someone who was enlightened, who saw through to non-duality, but who went on being the same guy because that, guess what? That's what really happens. You don't suddenly overnight become an angel. This is never going to happen. You still, you remain you because you realize it's the only game in town. Yeah, and, I, about, yeah, and I think, and I, and I think that people who do try to pretend to be more than human, that always ends in, in it's uh, going to end in disaster. It's going to yeah. end in disaster. You know, I yeah. prefer someone who I can straight up see is a bit of a rogue, because I, I know where I'm at, and I like that much, much more than phony people who appear, appear to be holy all the time. I'm just not buying your shit, mate, and I don't believe it goes hand in hand with enlightenment in any way. You know, 
Tall Gilm Trump has a big connection with uh, Scotland. Obviously, he founded mm-hmm. Sammy Lang, mm-hmm. the, 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 the Buddhist place and, and, and the borders. And of course, he crashed a sports car into a toy shop. It was, a, it, was a shop. it was a magic oh, shop. It was a magic shop. A magic shop. Well, it was on cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, I love that. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Jen, I think, spent a bunch of time at Sammy Ling. And I think David wow. didn't. David David Bowie did early on as well. And Trungpa told him to go be a musician instead. He, he was going to become a Buddhist monk. And Trungpa said, no, go be a musician instead. Because that's who you actually are. Yeah, it's a lot. That's, uh, that's one of those uh, hidden masters in plain sight. Yeah, there's something about Trungpa. He's, it's, it's crazy wisdom, definitely. But it speaks directly to me. I remember people said... Um, when he would when he would lecture at Naropa, he would turn up roaring drunk and he would sit on the edge of the stage, kicking his feet back and forth. And it was no longer about the Dharma. It was the Dharma. Hmm. And to me, that's amazing. What what Trungpa was doing then, whether consciously, whether he was drunk or not, who cared? He was pointing to the moment. And he was saying, This is it. And there are no words ultimately for what it is except to draw your attention to it. Yeah. The point as well as you can and then gasp as you see or experience the unwordable. And that's what the best music does and what the best magic writing does and what the best literature does. It takes you to the very cliff of meaning and then it points beyond. And I think Trungpa, drunk on stage, is exactly that for me. You know, that's great. I always put the imperfect gurus. Yeah, I went to uh, a couple of years ago. I, w- I got the chance to go to Naropa in Boulder. It's still there. And mm-hmm. it's like the most science. They have these thonkas up that would just look like science fiction Buddhas from 700 years in the future. It's the most profoundly <laughs> like intense sight. It looks like it's like stepping into an alien spaceship. It's amazing. Um, and wow. it's just, just hiding there. Um, one of Trunkpa's ideas that really uh had an impression on me is his idea of setting sun and rising sun art you know there's like art that is about death and decay and then art that celebrates life and applying that to the industrial scene i mean a lot of these bands were the extreme of setting sun i mean like you can listen to um you know certainly late period coil and also late period psychic tv as uh, after after lady j died is just like an extended death process almost um, and that was hard to be around. Uh, I couldn't be around it at a certain point. And so I kind of wonder looking at these bands, um, how many, you know, like, can we say that, can we say that people successfully kind of made it out and became, and by made it out, I just mean kind of becoming happy, productive adults, or did a lot of them just kind of end up not? <laughs> it, you know, I think it's kind of like 50-50 almost. Yeah, I mean, I really do believe that um, Stephen Stapleton from Nurse with Wind has always seemed to me as quite a happy guy. Mm. You know, quite a, a very a sort of fulfilled guy. In a way, I think perhaps out of all of them, he's the purest artist. Um, when I, I visited his... He he bought a, a piece of land. He put on an album called Soliloquy for Lilith. I mean, one of them probably absolutely amazing masterpiece drone record, so beautiful. And it sold really well at the time. One thing I remember is all these bands made a fuck of a lot of money for themselves back in the day. Mm-hmm. There was such a cottage industry that they made all that money. So, so I mean, Staple was able to buy land in the south, in the south, south of Ireland, which seems mad for an, exp- an avant-garde band. <laughs> I had no idea. But, um, yeah, it's crazy. He bought it, Kulorta, there's a record called Kulorta Moon. It's like named after the, the piece of land they bought. And it was a sort of a... There was the remains of a rundown cottage. And so for several years, he stayed, he, he bought a bus and him and his young family lived on a bus there. Well, he, without any training, without any architectural training or even any artistic training particularly, he began to rebuild the house and build the gardens around it. And when I visited him, um, which would have been uh, early 2000s, I think perhaps, um, it was a visionary environment. It was stunning. The house was beautiful. It was field upon field of strange hearts and he'd recycled everything. There was artwork made up of toothbrushes and he was just so driven to create. In fact, what he would do sometimes is he would take a, he would buy a bag of cement and he, he, his piece of land he had was in County Clare 
in Southern Ireland. And he would walk across the Burren, which is this very bare, sort of craggy, rocky area. And he would walk to these secret areas and he would build concrete statues in secret that no one would ever see. Mm. And that's what he would do during the day. And so in a way, again, like we're going back to this invisible magician. In a way, like Stapleton was always the happiest just when he was creating. It didn't really require an audience in the way in which I think both balance and, and debate really did. Mm -hmm. Interesting. One, when you mentioned Stapleton, one thing that I definitely wanted to ask you about is that house that David Tibet and, and Stapleton and Freya Aswin and everyone uh, was living in, because you talk about that in the book, and that sounds like a wild scene. Um, and it sounds like another, just, it, it sounds also like another example of what you're saying of living in an intentional magical way although to be fair it sounds a bit more frat house like than uh than maybe other examples <laughs> yeah i think it is. it's like frat house with runes or whatever <laughs> you know what i mean um but 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 yeah i mean i always think of that kind of that tibet he talks about being on the roof of that house and he's doing lsd and he's become obsessed by naughty and he has a vision of of naughty crucified in the sky one of Naughty as a sort of Gnostic icon. And I love that kind of shit. You know, I I, I want to hang out with the sort of people that are that, that are capable of believing they've seen a vision of Naughty in the sky who is who and who and Naughty is a Gnostic god. I love that. I love that sort of openness to experience. To me, it's the same ability that Blake had to see uh, 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 angels in the trees. And I think you're right, that sort of hot house experimental environment. Yeah, I have two sides to that. Part of me is would hate to be part of a sort of communal experiment. I really like to live on my own and I don't like to share. But at the same time, I love these experiments in communal living. I believe they're little, maybe scattered here and there through your life. They're like these little like high maximum velocity evolutionary moments in, yeah. in, in kind of your own life, you know? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that, and the trick to that is you have to leave at the right moment or you're going to end up addicted to drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? totally. Cause, cause well, they, those like, always, yeah. those always, uh, those always dissolve at a certain point and it just hedonism. It just seems to be a rule of how those things go. It seems, yeah. And it's interesting. Maybe and I, I get the kind of vibe, Jason, that you're probably similar to me and that I find that I am able to associate with some of the like, craziest you know, the kind of wildest, the most extreme people, the most extreme lifestyles, the most extreme behavior, and kind of not be sort of destroyed by it myself. Yeah. I'm able to get down with that sort of shit. I, I like that energy, but I'm also able not to let it overwhelm my own life. I but think I, still I think treasure it. I think part of that is just being a writer or having a writing background because you, you have the part of your brain that's always like, like, uh, uh, contextualizing it or or recording it or commenting on it and that i think kind of keeps you from full immersion and sometimes that's bad but other times it's pretty good yeah there's a there's a there's a dilemma there because sometimes you feel that you can sometimes you can be more the spectator than the taking parter but i i would turn that round and say it's that kind of I like to be in the, the zone of the silent watcher, you know, the the, the 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 Buddhist meditation where you click back in a silent watcher. And I would really enjoy to do that. Even when I was talk, I've talked a lot about that trip I had with uh, to see Coil in Western Supermare. And a lot of that trip, I felt like I was in sort of silent watcher mode. I would mm. sit on the couch and just mm. watch Coil unfold, and it was it was amazing. But I think also that sort of distance allows you to sort of survive those kind of scenes yeah a, a little i was always like that with jen and that definitely allowed me distance at, at important points um yeah i, like, I mean I, just, I, I like i enjoy this function that's why i like rock and roll you know what the thing about i dislike about contemporary rock and roll is that everyone wants to fucking be bono you know what i mean <laughs> for me back in the day bono was some even bono, even even bono wants to be bono he's trying really hard <laughs> It was always weak ass shit. It was always to be fucking Bono, man. You know, you see Sting going to the rainforest or whatever, and you're like, fuck this shit. You know, bring back Iggy Pop. But now, like, everyone wants to be fucking Bono. I can't stand that shit. I like a level of dysfunction, you know, and I'm able to be around even. 
a level of wildness and dysfunction just for the energy injection that it, that it gives me, you know? Yeah, I think that the Bono thing is funny because I, I imagine at a certain point of wealth and fame, you, you start to really, you know, think, is this all there is? And you decide to become a messianic figure. So a lot of these pitfalls we're talking about magic, I think, are also just pitfalls relating to um, being an artist, being a creative person, um, you know, or just being, you know, being visible in the public eye or, or being involved in drug culture, things like this. So for me, it's always important to pick, obviously, because if you're involved in this field at all, you're constantly going to get stuff like, well, what about Crowley? He died on drugs. Or like, oh, you're going to, you're going to summon forces you can't control. And like all this kind of, a like fear reaction that people have to it. And so for me, it's been important to, carefully disentangle some of the things that people react to in the in, for instance crowley you know clearly looking at what's magic and what's drugs um but the thing about, the thing about enlightenment or, 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 or magical epiphany is it's not good for you <laughs> it's not bad for you it, it just doesn't have any of these values this is about cutting through spiritual materialism you don't gain anything. Yeah. You're no better. Yeah. The idea that Chloe dies as a drug addict like, says anything about his his system is ridiculous. Right, right. His but system, yeah, 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 his system is not designed to stop people dying as drug addicts. Right. That's, that's a, that's that's a very good point. That. That's a very good point. Yeah. And it's I, I hate that. It's like, you know, it's like people will come at me like, when I had no money, people would say, "Well, if you're such a great ma- if you're such a great magician, why can't you just manifest some money? And uh, how come all the magicians die poor?" And I always say, "Like, well, how do you know that if you wanted money, you wouldn't be a magician?" It's like, how do you know that's what they wanted? You could say the same thing: Jesus died crucified next to two thieves. So was he a bad magician? You know. But then, no. But this is know. like also a misunderstanding. And and one of the the the, the, what, the things about Crow that's, that's the, the most difficult is the fact that he keeps using the fucking word will, which is really unhelpful and takes a long time to actually get to the bottom of what he actually means. And what he means by will is not a sort of ego directed thing whatsoever it just means like what kind of what kind of takes place in a way you know but people have this mistake that it's something about directing or forcing but it's something about letting things happen huh. more because most people believe that their will at first is everyone believes they're going to be super famous and really successful <laughs> but actually that's probably not anyone's will you know what i mean your will might be to leave a quiet, humble, nice existence. It might be Bono's that's will. Too. It might be Bono's it, will. It might be, you know what I mean? And that's fine too, you know? But it's a confusion with that kind of, that kind of idea. And that, that's what we mean when we talk about getting back to spiritual materiality, that we're going to get something from it. Well, how come that person's life who was spiritual, how come it went wrong? But it's not about your life going right or wrong. It's just how you live your life no matter what happens. Yeah, I agree it with that. Any better, and it's a spiritual thing that it improves you in any kind of way. It's not self improvement. If you want self improvement, go elsewhere. You know what I mean? That's a great point. I mean, and people always miss that because the the average observer ex- is expecting special effects and and passes on when they don't see any. Um, I wrote a book about John D, and one of the things that John D is always criticized for it's like, well, he died you know, he died in poverty and misery. And that proves that magic is horrible. And, and and I always say, it's like, did you look at all the other 70 year olds in Elizabethan England? You know, it can't be. It was, it was well, a horrible I, I time. I think his, his, his transcribed books alone prove that magic is real. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. That, that's it. That is the exact experience. I mean, John D. I I think had one of the most incredible experience of prophecy of, of what I'm talking about, prophetic books writing out of the ear. They are incredible, yeah. and I believe that those entities are, are objective, are objective things. I wrote an, early on. I wrote a book. Um, um, I, I decided I would get involved in a little bit of like demonology, and I, I wrote a book under the tutelage of the demon Paimon mm-hmm. from from the grimoire. It hasn't been published yet. It's going to be published next year, and uh, it was amazing because you really do. And again, you've got banishing rituals with these demons. Thank God, unlike most sort of uh, uh, when you're writing a normal novel. And for me, it was an experience akin to, to D because I began to feel that there was objective entities turning up. Even some of them released, uh, related to D. And definitely, I think when, when I was doing, when I was involved in ritual magic, I think the Enoch, Enoch is the heaviest shit. Oh, I agree with you and 100%. I agree with shit. Absolutely, absolutely. And, it, and it, it's also the stuff that works the easiest that you don't have to really 
I mean, unless you build the furniture, which is tough, but it's the only type of magic where you just read a spell off a page and something happens. It's really incredible. Oh my god! Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we, we I mean, my wife painted the whole shot for us, and we had all we went, we did it step by step. We oh, built nice. all the whole ritual with the tablets and all this. Yeah, I did and that too. Have, I have one of those. We used to have a group. Did you do that as well? We, yep. we used to have a group, and like we, we'd meet like once a month, and we we, we were scrying the ethers, and hmm. it, you might as well have turned up and taking LSD. I mean, it was fucking amazing. <laughs> You know? It's incredible, right? It's uh, it kind of takes you a while to get there, but for me, I think that Enochian is the main event for the, at least the ceremonial Kabbalistic tradition. Everything else is just uh, kind of um, baby steps to get you there. But then Enochian is also, I think, one of the things that's so beautiful about Enochian. I don't know if you had this experience, but it also erases. It also cures itself of magic at the end. It also erases itself. You kind of go through the ethers, and then you you have no need for it anymore. And that I think is really, that's really beautiful. Well, yeah. And it's also the whole, it's also the other thing about like, you know, the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, because Crowley admits that that is actually like a silly fantasy, which eventually you abandon. But, but yet somehow it takes you to the point of being able to abandon it. Yeah. I mean, isn't that magic? You know, it's like you, you posit, you posit an imaginary idea, which becomes real simply by dint of your will alone. I like your I like your definition of will too. I've had a couple definitions of it in my life. One is just making a decision. Uh, Cause I think Crowley from that time period was coming out of, there was all this kind of like German idealist philosophy and the idea of will was just really popular at the time. So he was kind of talking to the intellectual climate of the time, maybe hoping to be taken more uh, taken seriously. Um, but I think that will, I basically think that Crowley was a Taoist and I think that yeah. will your true will is what whatever's happening right now. I mean, how could it be anything else? 100%. This is obviously like what, wherever you are right now is, is, you know, sometimes new age people are really helpful because they say it's like, you know, it's like, well, um, where, you know, wherever you go, there you are. Well, that's from Buckaroo Banzai, not new age people, but you know, yeah, sometimes they have phrases that are really helpful. Um, but I think that's, that's what it is or that's what it becomes. But again, and this is going to lead me to another question, but I think there is such a quest and self, uh, there's such a quest element of magic. You have to like go through that phase where you think you're going to be 10 times more. You have to go through the messianic phase. You have to go through the, you know, yeah. obsessively doing all the stuff from books, just right phase. You have to, uh, um, go through the, the self-destruction phases perhaps, uh, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. and, and dark night of the soul. Absolutely. I mean, those are the most important ones sometimes. But what I wanted to ask you about on the back of that is um, that's a pretty male approach to life. Um, and I wanted to ask you about um, a lot of the women involved in these scenes, Freya Aswin, uh, Daniel Dax, uh, Cozy, um, Rose McDowell, and what th what their kind of approach to this was. Because it's really hard, you know, like the whole pulling the sword, pulling Excalibur out of the stone and going on your grand quest only to come home and realize you had it all along is, is pretty male. And no, and no, I don't, I, I don't agree. I, okay. I think what actually, what, what actually, what actually all those women that you've mentioned has in common with all the men is they were all out for adventure. They all lived their life as an adventure. And I can't think of a more exciting quest in a way than the one that Cozy Fanny Tutti went on. That's why she's such an amazing artist and How that's so? why she's such an incredible life. She met, she she went out there, she she did all this pornography in which she was in control of it. She made it as an art piece. She made experiences in her life. She saw them as art. She was able to read them as the universe speaking. I feel she had her own quest to become Cozy Fanny Tutti. She fully reinvented herself. And I think the sense of quest, this is what we were talking about earlier on when we were talking about Crowley saying joy and the endless winging, mm -hmm. the endless adventure. The, and it's not, it's not the end of the quest that is of interest because there is no ultimate revelation than arriving at the very same moment that you left from. But the excitement of the winging, the excitement of the going, I always say, when you remember gigs, that you went to when you were a young person and how what a magical, incredible time you had. It wasn't really ultimately just about the music or just about the band or just about the moment when they were playing live. It was about leaving home, getting the train into town, meeting your girlfriend or your pals, having that drink in the bar, staggering up Sucky Hall Street, having to flash your fake ID, 
Um, getting a kind of red stripe, getting drunk, the band playing, somebody pushed you in the mosh pit, missing the last bus home, sleeping on a bench in George Square. It's about the quest. It's about the adventure. And I do not believe that the adventure is gendered. Okay. Is it differently expressed, though? I think it's differently expressed by everyone. I think all the men in the book expressed it differently as well. They all went down their different routes. They were inspired, they were liberated to be adventurers. But the type of adventure they all went through, you know, Freya Aswan's adventure is very different from Cozy Fanny too. Hmm. It's very different from Rose McDowell's adventure, you know? Yeah, talk about them a little bit and and what, how their adventures were different. And uh, those these are names that were much more known in the industrial scene, but people may not remember who are listening to the podcast. Well, Hopefully they one do. One interesting thing about Rose McDowell, and we can also bring in some other people, like even like uh, Mark Almond as well, yeah. is that um, through these, these groups had an umbilical to the mainstream. They were connected to pop music. They weren't, it wasn't a sort of, this isn't a, a movement against pop music in any way. This is a parallel to all of this stuff. And they had these, Bjork as well. Bjork was mm-hmm. involved at Car 93 for a little bit. But people like Rose McDowell, she was in Strawberry Switchblade, this great, perfect girl duo that was like from Glasgow that played jangly 60s pop. Um, and yet she's singing for Car 93. She's singing for Coil. And so there was all these weird connections to pop music. Also like Mark Almond. Mark Almond does that amazing track, Titan Arch. Uh-huh. On, on the on the, the Coil album, Love's Secret Domain, one of their absolute masterpieces. And again, Coil covered Tainted Love. And in fact, the video for Tainted mm. Love for Coil, I think, was one of the first uh, things that Tate Modern acquired in London when, when it began buying modern art. And one of the interesting things about all this whole scene is this mutual relationship they have with pop music, all these different figures as well, you know? Yeah, maybe that would be a good place to talk about Derek Jarman too, because I don't necessarily know you're talking about the Tate Modern. I don't, I don't, I don't think he should be left out of this discussion. I mean, well, yeah, Jarman is, is is so involved as well. Well, I mean, this is an interesting point. For um, Sleazy would always say that, um, that gay culture at that time um, immediately radicalized you, um, and so um, he would say that being a gay man at that time was akin to an initiation into magic because being a gay man at that time sort of taught you that, that what we're told is reality or consensus reality is kind of a lie. And there are many yeah. things that are not allowed to be sort of factored in to that reality. He would always say, he would always complain that he said contemporary gay culture was just another shade of ABBA. <laughs> Whereas... Then he said it was a radical, it was an avant-garde. It was an inevitably an avant-garde sort of place to be. And, and, and Derek Jarman's place in that as a filmmaker and also his involvement with Coil, who, who soundtracked his films. Um, Derek Jarman is part of what I talk about is England's Hidden Reverse, which is, is an alternate history of, of marginalised creators who have yet got to the heart of what it means uh, to be English. And there is something, especially, I think it's Super 8s, are really special films. And they really interact effortlessly with sort of archaic ideas and mythological ideas Mm. and with very contemporary ways of being as well. I I, I think that... um, megalithic structures and gay disco sort of go hand in hand and jam in his vision of Englishness and I I fucking I love that mm. I absolutely love that and there's a but there's also a sense of requiem to, to Jarman's work very, very much so as there is with Coyle yeah. in that we're, they're witnessing an England that is passing and passing also with their own deaths yeah as you said earlier on, there's a there's a there's a foreknowledge of death in all of that work, and I think it also manifests itself in a quality of attention 
which is the ultimate magical art act we were talking about. And that journey to Avebury, wow. I mean, he has captured a time. That's a time machine. That is, and I can't remember when it's filmed. I'm sure it's the 70s. That is the 70s. I, I lived that. Hmm. That is a time machine. In the same way that Coyle's music are like time, almost literally, they have an album called Time Machine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that that idea of passing. Um, you know, we're in a different time now. We're in a, you know, Jen constantly talked about control and defeating control. And we're, you know, I, I think Jen died the week that COVID hit the US. Um <laughs> just like the exact moment that COVID hit, insane. it is insane. And it's kind of like, you know, it's been two years and it's, it's like, it's kind of like, I think Jen said when Topi ended, you know, I, I leave you all in a fine mess, and, <laughs> you know, which is uh, very, uh, very, uh, very funny. Um, but, you know, we live in such a controlled time. I mean, I, this is totally unrelated tangent, but I was just at the gym before this podcast and you know how, I don't know about the UK, but gyms here, they constantly have TVs blaring with every yeah, horrible yeah. advertisement. Yeah. And it's just, and I was thinking just the amount of, it's not only that modern culture is an illusion. Consensus reality is a lie. I was just thinking like how much, just in the most concrete sense, how much pure electricity and resources does it take to produce this fucking lie that we're in? That's not even one stable lie. It's just constant fragmented, insane distraction in which, you know, everyone is torn apart within, you know, brief contact with it. Uh, and, and, and I'm talking about even media figures, you know, have just a very brief lifespan now. Um, and it's a new type of control. It's a, it's a, it's a control by complete lack. Now that I'm thinking about it, you're talking about attention. It's a destruction of attention. It's like this Quran Zonic, um, uh, destruction of the ability to have attention. Um, and there's little islands and pockets in there. Podcasting, I think is one of them. Um, cause it's a beautiful chance to have an extended conversation with another human being. But, you know, this era, you know, sadly, but inevitably is, is done. And I think that we live in a, a time that is faced with similar, but in some cases different, and in many cases, worse problems than these people were reacting to. And I'm not quite sure what my question is, other than maybe do you see, well, here's my question. Do you see kind of stirrings of whatever the next magical revival is, is going to be? Well, look, what, what my first my first reaction to what you just said, Jason, I've got to be honest, as you sound like a Gnostic, you know, and it, it sounds like a sort of, you know, there's a sort of, uh, the, the world is being ruled at the moment by a sort of demiurge that we can any overthrow, like there's something wrong with, with, with now in the moment. Okay. And I hear you, man. And I hear you. You know, I rock and roll was, rock and roll's over. You know, the young generation are the anti rock and roll in so many ways. I get that, but you know, we talked about being out for adventure. Yeah, I'm out for it. I'm out for the world being fucked up and weird and crazy. I'm out for the next madness. And again, one of the things that um, magic does teach you it's a total contradiction because you don't believe in free will, but magic teaches you to act as if it did, it did exist, which somehow always seems to work is that, you know, there is individual responsibility. Hmm. I mean, I don't own a television. I don't read newspapers. I'm, I, I'm on Twitter. The only thing I interact with on Twitter is my own books or like positive fun things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and within that, I live in my own universe completely and I'm really fucking happy 24-7, you know okay. what I mean? Okay, okay. <laughs> and I think it's possible. I, I think it's 100% possible, you know? You know, we're never, you know, I almost think there's a sort of like utopian dream in politics that in a way, if we could get rid of the bad people, we could somehow almost legislate death out of existence. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think that's a sort of the ultimate sort of millennial dream of humanity. But um, I don't want to do that because I'm not even, you know, to me, suffering and death, they're also gifts. And they're gifts that allow us to hold on even harder to life. And to, and then it means so much more. It means so much more because the stakes are one hundred percent. So, 
to love each other, to live each day in joy, these are the huge, huge challenges. They're not easy, but I believe that's what being brave is, to live every day in absolute joy and not thinking that we've come to a certain point where the world is not worth living in or the demi or just triumphed. I don't believe it. You know, I always think that, you know, imagine if you could like, uh, imagine if you could like, if you're, if you're, your, your dream life was kind of film was turned into a movie. If your total dream life, if you could make that into a movie, it may be so boring. You would be born, <laughs> nothing that challenging would ever harm to you, and then you would die peacefully. Hmm. I mean, if that was a movie, you would walk the fuck out halfway through. You know? So I always think of the, the gift of difficulty, the gift of suffering. This is what this is what makes life worth living. Oh, that's beautiful. Maybe that's a good, maybe that's a good place to come to a, an end on because you kind of said it all there. Although I feel like we could talk forever, probably. Um, I do have one practical and, question. And Jason, I mean, I feel you and I, if I obviously had similar experiences and, and yeah. come in similar places. Yeah, you know? and and you're fun to talk to. This is, I think, one of my favorite podcasts. Yeah, this is great. Um, I have a practical question for you, though. Um, yeah, you talk you 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 talk about. Uh, curing yourself of magic and you become a fiction writer. I've been trying to do this for like 20 years and I always keep getting sucked back into uh, occult publishing and, 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 and so forth. How did you pull that trick off? Um, well, you know, I wrote for, I wrote for like over a decade, one novel after the other without ever submitting them because I didn't know anyone who, who wrote fiction. I didn't know how to get an agent. And something just happened to him. I became possessed. This happened in my mid theories. Um, I think at that time in my life, I suddenly, I always knew I wanted to write fiction. And I think in my mid theories, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to have to start now if I'm ever going to write these novels. And um, I also became capable in my mid theories of perhaps longer term projects or projects that wouldn't see fruition for years. But the way I, I became a, a novelist is I, I started the first novel. I ever tried to write, it was awful. It was so bad. It was awful. And I thought, I'm never going to This is the worst shit of all time. It was so cliche. But then I said to myself, you know, this is probably the moment where most people would give up. Mm. And they would say, all right, I'm not going to finish this. I'm obviously not meant to be a writer. So I, I took, a, I made a magical vow with myself. And I said, um, I'm going to finish this worthless novel. I'm going to take it right to the end. And once I finish it, I'm going to destroy it. And I'm going to start again. And I, I, I genuinely did that. It took me a year to finish the worst novel I've ever written. And at the end of it, I didn't just delete it from my laptop. I ritually smashed my laptop to pieces <laughs> with a hammer so that it could never be retrieved. And then I started again. And the next novel that I wrote was This Is Memorial Device, which became my first published novel in Faber and Famer. So... In a way, I kind of like, we're talking about these rituals, in a way that I think that whole ritual, one, allowed me to write hopelessly, knowing that no one would ever read it, and it would be destroyed. I think you have to write hopelessly hmm. in order to be a writer, in a way. And two, that I was, I don't know, I was able to be unprecious about it. I was able to get all of my cliched ideas of what a novel was out. Bob Dylan always talks about like writing like a rolling stone, like getting a stream of vomit out. And my first shitty book definitely felt like vomiting and then after that I felt like I'd expunged all of the cliches and I was able to somehow start again and that's when I believe I became a writer and that's when I believe I came to the point of I was talking to you about the prophetic books and whether it was a culmination of all of my magical and spiritual work I don't know but it was it was the creative task the creative moment the moment of becoming a writer when everything came together and it was no longer an idea there's no longer about something. I had become that or, or come at that point. Oh, okay. Well, good advice. I will uh I will think about that. That I I love that. The smashing your laptop. <laughs> I mean, but I mean Jason, no ritual taught me that in a way. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we, you should do the obligatory. Please let people know where to get your books and find out more about you. Well, um, if you're in the, the, the United States, my books are published by Europa Editions. I have two books available there. One's called Extabeth, which is, I think that that's one, that's a that's a little strange magical book. I think if you're interested in magic, Extabeth might be 
your favourite of my books. And I also have another book available in the USA called Monument Maker, which just came out and again from Europa. I'm published by White Rabbit in, in, in the UK. And my latest book in the UK is a book called Industry of Magic and Light. Um, and the book I mentioned, Monument Maker, is published um, August. It's published next month in paperback in the UK. Okay. Well, thank you again for uh, being on the podcast. I would love to do another one in the future if you're up for it at some point. Yeah, Jason, I mean, we've got plenty to talk about. I mean, I yeah. feel we could have done a couple more hours. So yeah, yeah, I yeah I'd so. love to revisit it, you know? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's revisit it then. All right, man. All right. Wonderful to meet you. All right. Great to speak to you, brother. Take care. All right. Hope you really, really enjoyed that. I definitely had a lot of fun in that conversation. Meet us at magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E, my school for magic, meditation, and mysticism, where you can learn all the skills you need to unleash your true self. I will see you in class. And until next time, hang in there.